So, uh, hi. Uh, we're not going to do introductions uh, because those will be in our presentations. Just want to give you a little uh, background onto what will be happening here this morning and what terrible mistakes we've made. Um, this is uh, Rami and Teddy, and um, we have been asked to, uh, to do a versus talk, which is a terrible idea, um, in PowerPoint, but it's, it's actually Keynote, but we're not going to talk about that. Um, and um, the basic idea is that we have prepared for each other a presentation. So Teddy has made my slides, and I've made Teddy's slides, and uh, we, haven't, we haven't seen them. And we have no idea what's in them. Regardless, we're going to try and give you all a good presentation. <laughs> and we are going to start with Teddy, which is why I'm here, because he can't see the slides yet. Okay. You want to go? Yeah, let me, give, let me give a quick context as well. Okay, right. go. We'll do introductions, but... Yeah, no, you do the introduction. <clears throat> I know, I know. For, for context, uh, Rami and I both make video games of different varieties. We'll do introductions. Um, and also, we are, I would say, at the moment, good friends. <laughs> for now. Yeah, so... Just a little bit longer. Uh, so the hope is that uh, we get through this together and that uh, we get each other to talk about things that we would want to hear yeah. um, from one another. Okay. Was that the idea? I thought I was just going to make jokes. Oh, great. Okay. Well. <laughs> so I just go now. This is it. Fuck. Can we curse? Okay. This is it. I'm ready. That's me. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> oh, this is going to go so well. Um, oh, you have no idea. I know. Don't use this for, oh, uh, nope. Don't use this for my introduction. I shouldn't read that out loud, right? Don't read the notes. <laughs> um, click when ready. Okay, cool. Um, there's no notes. Do I just, do I keep going? All right, I'm going to keep going. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I love you. Okay, good. There are so many slides. Uh, hi. Okay. I, sh I should say words now. Uh, I'm Teddy Deef. I'm an indie developer. Uh, I am Montreal startup indie studio Square Enix. Uh, oh, this is true. I am also the creator of Safari Rescue, an iPhone game available now, I think, still. Hyperlight Drifter and Jump Kick Justice and the writer. Oh, yeah, I wrote these things. These are articles I wrote. Uh, the Knife Mod for Unwinnable, which I recommend. Uh, high Fashion has come for our video games, which is on uh, polygon.com. Uh, yeah, so I make games. Uh, I made Hyperlight, which is an indie game, and now I'm at Square Enix, so that's kind of context for me. Um, oh, uh, let's see. Uh, okay, the colors are a little, like, gray, but I was kind of going for... This is, like, right after I dyed my hair gray, so I was going for, like, a gray thing. Um, the scarf is tucked a little weird at the bottom, um, but, like, overall... Like, the taper could be better, but... <laughs> Uh, um, okay. Oh, I already just talked about this. Good. Um, yeah, so uh, I made games. I've been doing that for uh, about a decade, I suppose. Uh, I also co-founded a working space in LA called Glitch City, um, to which I owe a lot of the things I've been able to make. Um, oh, oh, shit, I mean... Um, well, this isn't a selfie. Oh, but it said selfie or photograph. Um, I don't think I'm looking at the camera, but, but actually I've heard that that's like, so like, I've heard uh, statistically that like people are more attracted to photos where you're not looking into the camera, uh, if you're a man. Um, I didn't do that study. This is going so badly. Um, 
let's keep going. Uh, it's great. He, he, that guy looks, that was the best I ever looked. Um, yeah, okay. Um, so, uh, in making Hyperlight Drifter, uh, that started out of a co-op called Glitch City. So I met Alex Preston, who was the creator of that game, by the co-working space that we started together. Um, and then he asked me to work with him. So, uh, in addition to owing my sanity to that place by giving me a place to go to work every day that wasn't my bedroom, I also owe uh, a great deal of my uh, current success to, to that space. Um, and then last year, uh, sometime after we shipped Hyperlight, I decided to leave. I left Los Angeles and I left Montreal. I get to spend the whole time on this. Um, to go to, to Square Enix, a company that I've always loved, uh, who gave me an opportunity to make something that I wanted to make. Um, so, I don't know what I'm supposed to say or if I'm supposed to be crying yet. Um, but uh, that was a hard decision. It was harder in retrospect than I thought it would be to leave a community behind. Uh, they're still there, and I still uh, get to visit them sometimes. But uh, I certainly uh, am... Uh, uh, it is a different kind of struggle to not have that sort of indie community around. So don't, don't take your, your lovely indies for granted if you are one of them. Um, and if you are not, uh, then your community in whatever capacity you have is a great big thing to have to replace. So I was spending most of my first year in Montreal... Uh, building a brand new support system. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna move on from that. Yeah, oh God. Um, oh, I like this. Uh, I don't own those clothes, which is a shame. That scarf cost $200, and so I didn't buy it, but I got the photo. So if you're ever shopping, <laughs> and you're like, oh wow, John Barbados, let's go in this store. Um, so you can just get a good photo, like, and then it's like the same as having bought it sometimes. <laughs> Uh, cool. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so, uh, let's see. The value of personal aesthetics. Um, this is actually something that I'm trying to come back around and capture. Uh, I worked for three years on Hyperlight. It was my most public project. Uh, and like I said, the creator was Alex Preston, a good friend of mine. And so my job on that project as game design, as storytelling, as a producer as well, was to um, make that the best design it could be in support of the aesthetic that he had chosen. So my biggest, my loudest game on my portfolio has nothing to do with my personal aesthetic, other than a lot of design choices that I believe in. Um, however, uh, I'm a, a fairly loud person on the internet? <laughs> okay. okay. Never, I don't know why I turned to you. Um, and so, I don't know, like, I try to have a, a, a... I try to be careful about what I write to some degree. I try to be open emotionally, um, so I try to have both an approach to the way that I talk on the internet and what I use it for, as well as like uh, as a, a way to practice personal aesthetic, as a way to practice both in the context of selfies, but also just in the context of things that I like and things that I choose to signal boost, um, giving that image. And I think that some of the creators that I respect the most, um, you can see their work and you can see that it has come from them um, or from the team and like the team's aesthetic as well. So that is actually something like uh, my biggest, like one of my big heroes is a friend of uh, mine, Brendan Chung. Because you can see a game, you're like, that's a Brendan, that's a Blendo Games game. Because you know his aesthetic, you know his worldview, and if you know him as a person, it continues to make sense. So, as you are working on games uh, of your own and thinking about that, think about if you have a studio, if you have like a uh, the the fortune of having a, a series of collaborators, figure out what your aesthetic is together as a studio, especially if you intend on making more than one game. Um, see if you can find some consistency in that. Um, and yeah, of course, like try to put your own aesthetics into a game. You should be putting your taste into it and not someone else's. Okay. Um, well, I think that my emotion expresses how I feel about this photo. Um, this was not my personal aesthetic. I don't care for Kigurumis. Um, but I think that the color worked out nicely. I think my skin tone kind of matches the pink in a nice way. Um, <laughs> And my, my hair, I got my hair to show, even though I had to wear a hood. I hate wearing things on my head. Um, so, kudos.
Okay. Oh, thanks, man. Okay. You're welcome. I love doing this. I got you. Yeah. <laughs> Take a photo of me taking a photo with you. So I have to. Okay. Do you want to be in it? No, you, you're, you're the audience. Okay. okay. Get in the get in the photo. That's the wall. <laughs> okay. Wait, where's our light? Oh, this is. <laughs> it's bad. Okay. Um, is this everyone. <laughs> Smush in. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> Thanks, man. Okay, let's go. There's a hashtag. Uh, let's go. Okay. Whoa. Um, yeah. Uh, this is, okay, I like this slide. Thanks, Rami. Um, so, as I was saying uh, about the, the impetus of Hyperlight, um, I owe a lot of uh, that project to Glitch City and to that community. Um, I owe a lot of my ability to keep doing this, uh, like emotionally, to all of the friends I've made, not just in that very tight community, but in the broader community of conferences. So I don't know where each of you is at um, in terms of whether this is your first conference. So let's go around one by one, you first. <laughs> um, do we have, how much time? Okay. Um, no, but uh, no matter what, you know, what stage you're at, this is a really important community that you're building. Um, and what has been really valuable to me and encouraged me uh, to continue to promote games, because if you're making a game, you're going to want to promote it, which means you're probably going to travel, which means you're probably going to be away from home sometimes and away from your support system. And so you develop a support system um, from the people who who join you and who are there by your side at the next booth also dealing with all the same anxieties and exhaustion that you are. Um, so for example, I mean, Rami is one of my closest friends. Um, I love you so far. And, um, uh, and I, yeah, we've never lived in the same city. Um, uh, but we spent so much time together by going to these, these shows and through game development. So. Um, Take the opportunity to, uh, yeah, go into these shows with the people from your community. Like if you're from Melbourne or f from wherever you're from, um, band together and help each other, but also start to build that conference community uh, because you'll be seeing each other more and more. Oh, wait. Okay, sorry. Oh, God. Um, uh, it's, the light's real bad. So like the light is like above my head, so I'm casting like a shadow on my own eye. So it makes me look real tired, but it kind of works with what's going on there, which is uh, my loneliness. <laughs> um, okay, cool. Um, personal aesthetics in daily life. Uh, I like to like think about, I'm gonna talk about this in a couple of contexts. First of all, the obvious one is like clothing. I think that, um, I like to advocate for, for fashion, and I don't mean that in like a snooty way, I mean that in like a thinking about what you put on because uh, it can make you feel good. Um, uh, Bill Cunningham, who was a reporter for the New York, New Yorker, uh, or New York Magazine for a long time, he was a fashion photographer, and he would photograph people on the street, and he would say that uh, fashion is the armor to guard us against the reality of everyday life, and it is like a way of declaring uh, what you think, kind of, or, or how you feel about yourself, um, and it helps every day to go out into the world. So I think in terms of fashion, um, it's valuable. It's valuable um, to, feel, to feel like you're expressing something and that you're owning the way that, that you look uh, as you go out into the world. Um, I don't know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going. This is a great slide, though. Oh, thank you. Man, that was a good note. I can't believe... You predicted this. Uh, I like this one. Um, am I supposed to critique it? I have to say something negative? I don't really have anything negative. Yeah, I think, it, okay, I can be positive. I think, my, I think my jaw looks nice in this one. It's a really soft light. I have like uh, fairy lights in my, in my bedroom, so it's like a very light boxy sort of multi-directional light. But you get like a light on stage and it makes you all like shiny and like I'm sweating so you can tell. Uh, so this is like really good light. Look for that light in your life. <laughs> <sighs> I 
<sighs> okay, um, where am I at? We're good. Um, yeah, uh, context, um, self care. So let's see. Um, I have to do a lot of this, I think we all do. Um, I, especially for example in the last year I moved to Montreal which means I left my support system which means uh, I moved to a city that has weather again. I was in Los Angeles before. <laughs> um, so that's bad. Um, and I have like seasonal uh, affective disorder so like the winter makes me real sad. Um, so I do think that putting work into self care is important and I think that it takes attention, right? It's not just like do what you feel every day or like wake up and like treat yourself, it means like uh, doing those things, like if you, if you need a day to yourself, be alone, play a game you like. If you don't like being alone, that's okay too. Uh, I'm really extroverted and so sometimes I feel sad and alone and people will sometimes tell me like, learn the value of being alone. Uh, and that is something that's important but also sometimes you don't have to be good at that all the time. You can be like, I need someone, I need to like go outside and that's okay. Um, but I think also a part of self care that I would recommend uh, as not a therapist is to um, force yourself to, to have like rules and, uh, and uh, processes. So like for example, every morning I wake up and usually uh, there's this adage that being in the shower is like a good time to think about things and to develop ideas and to let ideas settle. Um, but oftentimes I get into the shower and then I have like a, ba like a bad thought. I have like a thought about a bad memory and then I just spiral about that. And for me, part of my self-care process and putting work into it is actually the mental work of like saying, no, you're not allowed to think about that today. This is not constructive. You've covered this. Like, let's move on. Um, I'm just going to keep going. Oh, oh okay. Uh, <clears throat> where did you, oh, Instagram. <laughs> uh, uh, it's like, it's fine, I don't know, it's good. Um, I don't, uh, my hair, I bleached my hair for the first time and this was the process of me bleaching it and feeling weird about that. Um, so I took a photo and then like framed it and like tinted it in a way where I was like, I like this, don't freak out, like this is okay. I did this as a process photo, not because I thought it looked good, but because uh, I wanted to kind of like, I wanted to take it and then glamorize it and be like, cool, like it's okay, you, you look good even though you look like kind of wacky right now. Okay, we're doing this. <laughs> Four minutes? <laughs> okay, uh, do I have lyrics? Okay. Is this just going to work? No, no, just leave it. What? Go back. Okay. Just leave it. You know how to use a microphone. Yeah? Oh, there's no backtrack? Oh, there's a backtrack. Okay. <laughs> oh, you might have to. You might have Do to I have to click? Uh, Don't right. just skip past an automatic slide, man. You're a professional. Oh, what a shame. It's not working. Oh, it's working. Oh, you'll have to look there. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. I can't lose anything if I don't learn Except my house, except my house Can I go higher? I got games, but no profile comes blowing up And no one I can tell I've had enough, I've had enough One, two, three, one, two, three, three One, two, three, one, two, three, three One, two, three, one, two, three, three All I've worked it out
Let's get on your word out. Gotta get some clicks. It's all a game. It's all a game. Ah. One, two, three, one, two, three, three. One, two, three, one, two, three, three. One, two, three, one, two, three, three. Don't look back, cause I know that. You could have like given me a hint so you start like warm up Teddy, like something's gonna happen. <laughs> uh, thank you to Marioki uh, for letting us use that rendition of Chandelier. Uh, it's important to thank the people whose work you steal. Um, whoa. What was the hashtag for that? Hashtag selfies for Teddy and hashtag GCAP17. Okay, we're going. Not again. Um, <laughs> whoa. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about leadership. How much time do I have for this? You have like minus two minutes. Okay. Here we go. Uh, leadership. Um, uh, be open. Be honest. That is maybe the biggest lesson I've been learning over the last year. So I went from being on an indie team where, uh, although we had a creative lead, we were a very democratic team. There was no one who was like explicitly the boss. Um, in terms of day-to-day -day practice, like it was very much a thing. And now I'm in a context where I have to accept that I am a boss, that like I have a role that says I am a, I am a creative director, not like I'm a boss, like I'm cool. Um, uh, there is like a hierarchy, there's an organization, there's an org chart. I, actually there is not an org chart, but hypothetically there is. Um, and so what I did immediately was like close up. I was like, oh, like I have to be like uh, commanding and like confident and stuff, which just goes against everything that I am. Uh, in the sense that I like being publicly anxious and I like, like being open about that. Um, and I found that it mostly only hurt me that like obviously uh, there are some situations where you have to make a decision and then present that decision without all of the, the freak outs you had to get there. But uh, it's important to stay open to tell your team when there's something you feel strongly about, when there's something that you could use their help with. Um, I think getting siloed as a leader is the biggest thing you can do wrong. That, that was quick, right? Oh wait, did I do a selfie thing? Oh, this is so good, I love Nier Automata. That's just, I don't know. Oh Nailed it, right? Nailed it. Uh, how to set explanation is, I kind of talked about this too, so I can, I can move on. Um, yeah, personal sex for game development can go into things like uh, visuals, or if you're like me, I'm not an artist in any way. I have like very little visual, uh, at least traditional visual skill. Um, so aesthetics can also mean the things that you love, right? There's an adage in writing of write what you know, uh, and that can be really, really hard because sometimes you feel, if you're me, you feel that what you know is boring. Like uh, I, I don't have like, I didn't feel like my childhood was like really exciting or like rich, like I didn't go to a lot of like, cultural things, I didn't absorb a lot, um, or I thought I didn't, that was valuable. And it takes time to realize like no matter what you've been through, no matter what you've come up through, uh, even if you consider some things of your past to be like the like, the stuff you grew out of, the stuff you like grew in, like, oh, now I'm a creative. Um, it's important to go back and see, like, what did that mean to you? How can you use that? Because that's ultimately going to be the most authentic things you can pull from. This is a roller coaster. Oh, cool selfie. Uh, ooh, um, I don't know. This is a process pick. I think. Uh, a process pick? Well, I was brushing my teeth. I was in the process of brushing my teeth. <laughs> No comment. Okay. Uh, okay. 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 Um, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Community clubs. Clubs. The value there. People there. Boy. Um, right people, right time. Yeah. Um, I've done a lot of like looking for people uh, in the context of making games, both in terms of trying to find new members for our co-op space, Glitch City, or trying to hire people, both onto Hyperlight when we were growing a little bit and now into Square Enix. Um, and uh, I think uh, something that is true and maybe something, one of the reasons that you're all here is that it, it pays to show up, it pays to meet people. Um, and I think that the best thing you can do is not 
in, uh, interpret that as something gross, like, oh, it's good to network and it's good to, like, be known, but that um, ultimately when you're making games, you're spending, like, at least half your daily life, if not more, working on something with those people. So they are people who you have to know and you have to respect. You don't necessarily have to be best friends, uh, but you have, to, you have to get to know people um, if you're going to work with them and if you're going to help each other. So whether that's in the context of making games or whether that's in the context of filling, filling up a community, um, it, it helps to, to be in as many places as you can because you don't always know when the right time is. Uh, I actually joined Hyperlight. This is like a tidbit people don't know. I um, was on a break from a project I was working on and I was looking for contract work. And I was like, oh, I'm free. I, like, I want to go back to this other project, but I need money. So I was looking for money right around the time that Alex approached me. Um, so that was not at all what I was planning on doing. None of my like, successful moves have been anything that I plan on doing. So right time uh, is completely out of your control. So just be uh, as active in the community as you're comfortable being uh, on your level of extroverted or introvertedness. Um, and that will have a ripple effect into, <laughs> yeah, it's nailing it. Um, into, into your career and into the steps you make because you don't always get to pick them and usually uh, it's about multiple choice, right? It's not always fill in the blank. It's usually here are my options. I have to pick one and I have to take a step gradually towards where I want to be in a few years or whatever. Cool. Oh, selfie. Oh, yeah, that's good because the last word I said was whatever, which is a terrible way to end. Um, uh, oh, this photo. Um, I was just showing off a, this is a product plug. I tried like actually, I'm trying to be better about when I have like things I like, like a pan or clothes to like tag the company that made it because um, I used to think that was gross. I used to think that was like weird, but I think it's good to like point at the people who made the thing, even if they're like a big company. It's like give them the credit where credit is due. And if you can find the name of the actual designer, even better. Cool, I'm done. I did it. Uh, I think you're, you're just up next, so you should press the slide when you're ready. This is, ladies and gentlemen, this is Rami, and this is going to be a much better talk. It's going to flow more smoothly. <laughs> Rami has a reputation for being like the best public speaker, um, so you definitely won't be disappointed <laughs> in any way. Um, will I be disappointed? No. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> that makes it worse. And yeah, I do want to thank uh, Marioki again for uh, loaning me or letting me use that, uh, that amazing Sia rendition that they made uh, specifically, uh, you know, about me. Really weird. <laughs> really weird. Not what I expected, but uh, hey. It's a song that's uh, hard to reach, so. Whew! <laughs> yeah, <wouldn't>, yeah. <laughs> it's too much fun. Uh, anyway, thanks for playing along, uh, everybody. Good. Hi. <laughs> so um, yeah, I've been uh, I've been making games since I was six. You have like one minute for this. Oh God. All right. So um, I've worked on uh, a bad uh, choose-your-own text adventure that uh, was uh, you could go east or west. If you went east, you fell into a pit and died. If you went west, you won because I hadn't figured out how to do nested if statements yet. I don't remember what it was called. Um, <laughs> I did a lot of uh, StarCraft uh, maps, uh, including one that was called Horizons, which was basically like I don't like it was basically sort of a bad MOBA, but like 20 years ago or 15 years ago. Um, so that didn't take off back then. Uh, I used to work on independent games in the Star Ray 3D game series, which was Space Sims that uh, were uh, made by a guy in Boise, Idaho. Um, and then I joined Vlambeer. Um, I mean, there's a lot of really bad stuff in between there, but uh, I joined Vlambeer. I worked on Radical Fishing, Super Crate Box, uh, Gun Gods, Karate, Dinosaur Zookeeper. Um, that was a bad name. Um, Yeti Hunter, uh, Luftrauser, Luftrausers, Ridiculous Fishing, uh, Wasteland Kings, Nuclear Throne, Glitch Hiker, uh, not with an S, without the S at the end, uh, which is a game that died. Um, God, shit. Uh, probably some more that I'm forgetting, but I'm out of my minute. Is that, is that, am I, am I good? Am I good? Why do I make so many games? <laughs> I want to click through this. 
All right, so I'm just going to give a, a quick uh, uh, breakdown of my uh, my time in uh, every week, which is always the same. Uh, I never travel. I'm always in the same place. So this is going to be really easy uh, and definitely not uh, incredibly impossible. Um, so uh, yeah, this is a good this is a good slide. Oh come on. Uh, <laughs> it's well done. Uh, so yeah, I spend uh, I try to spend about like two hours writing emails every day. Um, I get about 700 a day on average, uh, which means that I create an un, sort of like a filter system that allows me to uh, filter those emails into different subjects because I found that it's not the writing the emails that's really exhausting to me, it's the switching between the different mindsets. So I do business at Vlambeer, but I also do marketing, I do a bunch of production, I do a bunch of design. Uh, and it was just like the constant switching between like, oh, I have my business hat on, oh, let me switch to the design hat. Like that was just. I couldn't keep doing it, so I created these uh, these subheaders, these sub emails that people can email to, and I only pick one a day that I answer. So today is a design day, and then today is a design day, and I will not look at business, I will not look at marketing, and if it's urgent, too bad, should have sent it earlier. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I've, I've become very, uh, like, like Teddy was saying earlier, I've become very rigorous about some of the rules in my life to just keep me sane, because there's just so much happening all the time that uh, not doing that becomes uh, dangerous to your to your to your own health. Um, about the majority of my day writing tweets, honestly, um, I think I'm not a game developer at this point. I'm just professional Twitter user. A professional might be overstating it. Uh, obsessive Twitter user. Uh, Twitter was really big at the start of my career. Uh, back in 2010, Twitter wasn't as big nor as toxic as it is nowadays. So. Um, it was a really good way for me to sort of like sanity check a lot of the things I was thinking and saying when I was young and just getting into the industry and didn't really know what I was doing. I still don't know what I'm doing. But um, what was nice about it was it, it gave me access to a lot of people real fast. And um, in the past few years, Twitter has sort of changed for me from being something that I did to, um, to learn and reach out to friends to uh, something that I had to realize has a lot of power. I have 132,000 followers at the moment and I'm sure like 20,000 of those are bots, right? Because that's how it goes. Um, but I realized that a lot of people read my tweets, which is fucking terrifying. Like I say something about a thing and it might be a, a headline the next day and that's, that's creepy, right? Um, so in the past few years I've, I've really started switching to, uh, to using Twitter a bit more as a, as a way of communicating professional thoughts and then every now and then um, dealing with uh, personal uh, personal things, although I've mostly built a support network of, of hopefully still friends like Teddy um, around me to make sure that I have people to talk to when I need that. Um, so this is this is one of those things that switches a lot. So Flambeer is a two-person studio, so I, I do write the code, I do write the large majority of the code of Flambeer. Um, but usually how that works is at the start of a project, JW, my co-founder, will be prototyping in Game Maker and he does all the code and I do zero of it. And at that period, during that period of time, uh, I will mostly be working on positioning the game, on the business, on the marketing, preparing for which events we're going to hit, production schedule, make sure that we have budget, make sure that we have partners, make sure that the platforms are aware of this game coming up. And then when JW is done and has like an 80% build of the game, I'll go back and look at how good the code is cry at how bad the code is and then start rewriting the code to be a, a professional release. Uh, so it kind of like shifts. Uh, at the moment I'm not coding anything because we don't have a current project uh, in development. Um, but uh, I, do, I do really need programming. Like I've been a programmer since I was six and if I don't get to like wrestle with some code every now and then I just, I get so sad. So um, I have to yell at computers occasionally about how bad they're handling my code. Because it's definitely not my code that's the problem. Like as every programmer knows, it's never you. Um, yeah, then I spend a lot of time talking to developers. I've actually, in the past few years, I've come to realize that uh, a large part what what is beautiful about the games industry to me is you, uh, is is people that want to make games, people that are making games, the game developers that are here, but also the game developers that are not here, that are everywhere else. Um, and it's not just young devs, honestly. Uh, every developer that I speak to, I've learned something from in some way. Um, and it's just whether it's like their perspective or their enthusiasm or their uh, sometimes naivete, uh, sometimes their experience, sometimes their, their projects, sometimes 
you know, just like a sit down and a, an honest heart to heart with somebody you, you don't know very well, but you share like the passion for games with. Um, whatever it is, like the developer community is what inspires me um, to do the work I do. Um, so it's a, it's a huge part of, of what I do. Um, I have made a rule for myself to play hour, uh, games for two hours a day because I realized at some point that I stopped playing video games and that was sad. So it's weird because I've never been a games player in that, in that way. The first game I played was Gorillaz.bas which was a QBasic thing that I then modded uh, because you could do that. So I've never seen games like a whole. It's always been like text that would somehow translate into a, a game. So I always knew that you could modify games and that's always been part of my, my uh, interest in games. Um, but I realized that I wasn't playing games anymore and I got really sad. So nowadays I play two hours of games a day, uh, no matter where I am, no matter what I'm doing. Uh, if I can't, like, I miss, I miss scheduled, I miss budgeted my time. Um, and this is just a very personal thing, but I'm just continuously amazed at what people in this medium are doing, whether it's like the AAA developers or the indies or the experimental community, whether I'm downloading a weird random game on itch.io or, you know, buying like the latest AAA blockbuster. There's always something that's just incredibly inspiring. And I, I deeply hate the, the fake divide that a lot of the world has created between AAA and indie because honestly, they're all games and they're all beautiful and there's all people working on it that are creative and passionate. So, I mean, I was here yesterday wearing a Destiny shirt because that game means more to me than any other game in the world because my fiance proposed to me in that game. Um, and it's a AAA game, even though I'm an indie that has kicked against like the establishment that I don't know what for like many years and now I just regret all of that because they're all beautiful games. Something that will surprise them? Yeah. What, what, do we, what, do you, what does no one ask you how long you spend doing that you spend on time? Ooh. Um, something that will surprise people. Well, airplanes won't surprise people. Um, watching movies won't surprise people. Learning to play, play piano? I've, I've realized that I like, a lot of, I like a lot of media, but I have basic competence in most forms of media. I can, I can draw, I can write, I can code, I can, um, I can do all sorts of things. I can make sound effects with my mouth. Um, I can't play an instrument, which has always sort of frustrated me, so I've been practicing piano. Um, so that's a thing. You really nailed my aesthetic. <laughs> so one of the things I think is important about uh, conference life, if you are going to be traveling and going to more events, one of the nice things that you have here is that Melbourne International Games Week is all in one week. If there is something that's negative about Mel Melbourne International Games Week is that it's all in one week. Um, one of the things I really, really want to um, remind you of, if you are younger than me, uh, is that you won't keep this up forever. Uh, if you are going to every party, every night, everything, every social opportunity, that might sound like good networking and like good opportunities. It's actually not because you're just going to be tired and miserable at all of them uh, or drunk uh, to keep up with it uh, if you drink. Um, those are all bad states to be in, so probably don't. Um, I've kind of made a rule for myself to try and hit one or two parties at each conference and to really get to know two or three people at each conference. Like I will meet many of you throughout this week and um, as you might imagine, looking at this room, it's going to be hard to remember all of you. That doesn't mean I don't care for you, it just means that there's so many people uh, and you are going to meet so many people during this week and I want you to not necessarily feel bad about not remembering all of them. Um, instead, what I would want to recommend you is to just get to know two or three people really well. Like, get to do a sit down, have a chat, um, grab lunch. Um, it can be small groups, you know, like four or six people, something like that. But don't just feel like you have to get to know everybody and you have to make notes on everybody because it's just not, that's not how it works. Like, we're not here to maximize our LinkedIn network. And if you want to do that, like, you know, add me to your professional network on LinkedIn. <laughs> but um, 
what is important here is the human connections you make. So try to focus on human connections, not quantity of connections, but quality of connections. Um, the other thing is just sleep and shower. Um, <laughs> but make sure you sleep. Uh, I try to hit seven hours of sleep a day. I actually have a Fitbit right here that tracks it. If I don't hit seven hours, I've fucked up somehow. Um, part of that is just because I'm traveling. I'm jet lagged. I have no idea what the sun is doing outside because I've only been here for three days and I was on the other side of the planet before and I'm going to be in America in like three days. I'm not going to have any idea where the sun is there either. Uh, there's moments where it's like noon and I look up at the sky and have no idea if the sun is going down or up. But I need to hit seven hours of sleep, so I make sure that I hit seven hours of sleep. Um, the final thing is eat. Like, it's easy to forget, but if you, if you are at conferences, make sure you get some time to eat proper food, not just the snacks that are available there. I'm sure they're good. I'm sure that the event and the conference center have paid good money to have them here, but go out and have food. Um, and if you have food, try to bring some people with you, just a few. It really helps. If you need some time alone, take some time alone. Uh, it's really no shame to go back to your uh, hotel room or wherever you're staying and just take some time for yourself. Uh, or if you're Teddy and you want the opposite when you're tired, go find people that want to hang out. Like, just really take care of yourself. Um, <laughs> you really nailed this aesthetic. It looks like this was made in like the last five minutes before this presentation, which is exactly right. <laughs> so good. Wow. You can tell we're close friends because he nailed it. Um, Jesus. <laughs> An over detailed post mortem and cost, be cost benefit analysis of PACs. Okay, um, let me grab my email. Um, no, so um, PACs in general costs about two and a half thousand, three thousand dollars. That's US dollars. All of the numbers I'm going to be talking about are US dollars. Uh, that's just for the space. And on top of that, there's. Um, there's technology, which usually comes in the form of TVs and laptops. What we usually do is we buy the TVs and the laptops and we actually store them, uh, which tends to be cheaper than doing anything else. So we have a storage box in Seattle, we have a storage box in Boston, we have one in San Antonio. Uh, we don't have one in Australia, but maybe one day. Um, but we just store stuff there and at the end of the year it just comes out for our next show. Uh, we usually tend to keep laptops for like three to four years, uh, except for that one time we duct taped them to something and all the keys came out. Um, <laughs> then we had to redo it. Um, Vlambeer's uh, general aesthetic is a bit like haphazard, like, like that. Um, which means that a lot of our boots actually come out in the last like four to six hours before we actually start the show. The last time I was at PAX Australia, it turned out that there was no booth graphic, which meant that I went to a, a do-it-yourself store and bought, the, bought a piece of cloth, black cloth, and then a piece of yellow cloth, and then cut the flambeer out of a yellow cloth and then duct taped it together, and then used that as our booth graphic. Um, I've also once used a booth where um, Wacom was going to showcase at Back South for their first Back South, and uh, they didn't show up. So they had this empty booth at their first ever Back South, and uh, that doesn't look good to the people who have spent money to be there. Uh, so they, um, I went to them and I said I would happily take the booth. So they said yes, and then I had to buy a booth on the second day of Pax. Um, so I ended up with um, garbage bags as carpet because it was the only thing I could find that was black. Um, and then just a bunch of laptops. You can do packs at a lot of budgets. You can do it at a relatively small budget if you have a $1,000. Um, you can do a PAX, although for you all it's going to be PAX Australia because the other ones are far away. Um, <laughs> but um, it's really, as it starts at like two and a half and it gets as silly as you want. Uh, in general, I would recommend you if you're an indie, like make sure you get good banners which will cost you a few hundred dollars. Uh, make sure you have TVs. Don't rent them from the conference center in general because they would charge like $700 for a normal TV and it's cheaper to just buy one. Uh, a lot of people will recommend you to return the TVs after you're done. I can't do it. I used to be a computer salesman and that would break my heart if I sold six computers and then two days later they're like, hey, we're done, have them back. Um, so I just can't do it. Uh, it might be cheaper to just store them and keep them and better for your um, karma. Um, 
the reason we always do a booth is because um, I think a lot of building a brand is repetition. Uh, a lot of people don't remember things the first time. I'm not going to remember most of you the first time we meet. But if we keep meeting, eventually like something will click and something will stick. And that's kind of how we deal with brands as well. When you see a commercial for the first time, it doesn't sit. Nobody buys one commercial unless it's like really big and explosive. If you do like three or four of them, that might, um, that might stick. So for Vlambeer, part of why we're there is just because we want people to not forget us, which is why I'm wearing this shirt now, which is how I do fashion, I'm doing a talk, so there. Um, and the other thing is just it's really uh, motivating for me to talk to our fans and just get to see the people that play our games, get to hear their stories. And sometimes they're beautiful stories. Um, and sometimes they're just, I spent 2,000 hours on your game and failed my final axioms because of it. Which, don't do that. <laughs> oh, God. All right, so um, DICE, who knows what DICE is? Just raise, raise hands. Good, so DICE is this conference um, that is uh, incredibly expensive, um, incredibly business focused. Um, it comes, if you, if you go there for like $2,500 or something, it comes with a optional golf tournament, go-kart tournament, or um, I think like a $1,000 buy-in poker tournament. Um, it's incredibly business. It's overwhelmingly business. Um, but Teddy is making me explain why that's not bad. Um, and it actually isn't, like he's totally right. Um, what is interesting about DICE is when you go to a lot of conferences, one of the things you're going to run into is a lot of the people that have the most potential to affect the industry are going to be incredibly busy. That's just how it is. At this conference, if you're trying to get a hold of some of the people that are working on like the big games, the keynotes, the you know, stuff like that, you're gonna find that they at best have like 10, 15 minutes to like hop between the 500 conversations that are gonna happen. Um, what's nice about DICE is everybody that's there is incredibly busy, but also since they're at DICE and there's only a few people, they all have time to sort of hang out and talk. If you are in any way interested in uh, dealing with the uh, structural side of the industry, so the politics, the, the lobbying, the way uh, government interferes with games, the way government supports games, um, the way large companies work together, the way uh, leadership works in the games industry, uh, or you're just incredibly interested in figuring out more about investment um, and that type of business, that is actually a really good place to go. Uh, if you want to go, I would generally recommend that you go at a point where you can spare $5,000 to fly to the United States of America and buy a ticket. Um, that's probably not going to be many of you that want to spend that money, but if those are things, if everything I said to you just now sounds interesting, it's a really good conference. Uh, I, I, enjoy it, I enjoy it a lot because um, it helps me help indies, um, helps me talk to the platforms and figure stuff out. Fuck. <laughs> so cloning is still a problem. It will always be a problem. It will remain a problem. Uh, if you make a good game, people will try to steal it. Don't worry about your game being cloned. Uh, if your game is really good, that's the only time it will get cloned. Uh, if you're going to be really secretive about it, by the time you're ready to announce and somebody starts cloning it, you don't own it yet. You don't own it in the mind of the people. So if you're going to make a game, be as open about it as possible. Talk about it as much as possible. Own your own game. So if somebody clones it, people know that it was yours first. OK, I'm going to have to rush through the rest of these. Uh, Destiny 3, a pitch. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, you, a, a serious design. Oh, fuck. Um, I honestly, I think they nailed it with Destiny 2, and I'm just going to need more time to see where Destiny 2 goes to really say where Destiny 3 should go. It's, just, it's too early. <laughs> it's such a good job. Um, what happens in the story? I, I want the tower to be rebuilt. So me and, me and my fiance got engaged in the tower, and then it was really sweet. Like she did, she did all of this work to make sure that there was 
something in Destiny that she could use to propose to me using uh, Bungie's help to do that. And then the first trade of Destiny 2 was the tower getting blown up. So I was kind of... <laughs> um, so I just kind of want the tower to be rebuilt. That's, that's it. Um, it's true. <laughs> this is my fiance. I miss her. Um, I will see her in a few days in Seattle. And she does make me a better Rami. Um, yeah, find somebody that loves and supports you um, and that you can love and support because... Like Terry. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've never been... I've always had the rule to like not get romantically involved in the industry and this is what broke that rule. She is. Um, and I couldn't be happier about having broken that rule. She's the best. <laughs> Did he do well? Yeah. Did he sing a good song? Yeah. How did you know I was going to use that slide? <laughs> oh God, yeah, no, we're good. He's going to kick us off the stage. Thank you so much for being here.